Hey there, Kazen here, and welcome back to Always Doing. We are reaching the end of Vlogmas, which means that it is time to go over my best books of 2019. This is a series of three videos, broken into the three buckets that I used to consider my reading, so that's fiction, nonfiction, and romance. We're starting today with romance. I pick my top five books in each, and these are for books that I read in 2019. They don't necessarily have to be released in this year, although I think all of the romance books are new releases. I know some purists think that this is too early to make a best of list and because there is like a whole 10 days left in the year, but you know what? If I do read something that is worthy of this list, I'll let you know in my December wrap up. Here we go, my top five romance books of 2019 in reverse alphabetical order by title because that's how I run things around here. So the first one is The Rose by Tiffany Rice. It's book number two in her The Red series, but it reads completely okay as a standalone. Leah is graduating college and her father is throwing a big party and there's all different kinds of people there. And one of the gifts she gets is actually an artifact. It's a goblet that's from ancient Greece and she thinks it's really pretty, but then she finds out from somebody who is at the party that she doesn't know, named August, that it's more than just a goblet. He says that if you drink from it, your greatest sexual fantasies will come to life. She doesn't believe him, but she's game to try, and everything goes from there. Parts of the plot end up revolving around Greek mythology, which is totally not my thing, but that's perfectly fine. You don't have to know anything about mythology to get a lot out of this book, and there's lots of different themes and conversations and topics that are brought up. Like, for example, first of all, it's super feminist, which I love, and also, like, why we know the myths we do. That what if there were a myth way back in the day that was a woman being kick-ass, but the men who were the ones who decided which myths got recorded and passed down through time didn't like it, well then we wouldn't know about it, right? It's full of consent. August is very, he's so sweet. He's so incredibly sweet and understanding because Leah did not have some great first experiences with sex and just going through and becoming sexual in a way that's pleasurable for her, like it's something they work through and is loving and interesting and let's admit fun to watch. Most of Rice's books have some kind of romance in them but they vary across the genre. She has some stuff that's more gothic, she has some stuff that's historical fiction, and she has stuff that's full-on BDSM. This is a great place to start if you want to try one of Rice's sexy books but without the BDSM. There's not very much bondage or submission or anything like that in here. It's fun, it's fascinating, and it brings together almost all of the things that I love about Rice and shows her off to best form. Next is Reaver by Anna Zabo. This is the third book in the Twisted Wishes series, and it probably could be read alone, but I wouldn't recommend it because there's quite a nice through line going through the three books. The first book is Syncopation, and actually Syncopation made my best of romance list last year, so if you just want to go have a look at that, that's totally cool too. Twisted Wishes is a queer rock band. In the first book, they're an opening act for other groups, but now in book three, they're headlining on their own and becoming quite popular. We've watched all the other band members find love, so now we're to Mish. Mish is the bass player. She's a bit of a protective sort, and she's not above throwing a punch to protect one of her fellow band members, except that she just did that and she ended up busting her hand. And the band is realizing that venue security isn't quite enough for them anymore, and not only because of these kinds of scuffles, but because Mish has a stalker that's sending all these creepy emails with paparazzi-like photos, and it's just, ooh. So they hire David. He's private security, and he's there for the whole band, but especially for Mish because of this whole stalker thing going on. So it's a falling in love with your bodyguard kind of story, although I've never seen the movie so I can't compare it to that. Mish is pansexual, tr uh, David is a trans man, and I should say Anazabo is non-binary. And the way that everything is handled is so wonderful and there's lots of positive modeling going on. So for example, David is cis passing, so Mish doesn't realize that he's trans. And when he comes out to her as trans, we see it through his eyes. We see how nervous he is in saying this, how he's worried what she's going to say, how she's going to react. And we see her reaction through his eyes and see how honest and open and genuine and loving she is hearing this news and it's just wonderful. What I find interesting about the romance is it's something you don't see very much, which is like, likes, like, in that it's not opposites attract, it's that both Mish and David have very, they consider themselves protectors of their friends, of their loved ones, and for David it's literally his job. And in the beginning that means that they understand each other really well, that they can put, they can like put themselves in each other's shoes, 
which is helpful, but it also leads to problems down the line, and I thought that was super well done. The entire Twisted Wishes series is full of found family, and it's just so lovely. I'm sad that the series is over, but excited to see what Zappo does next. Next is a book that I'm sure you've seen everywhere, so I'm not going to talk about it quite as much, but it's Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. In a slightly alternate America, a woman has become President of the United States, and her son, Alex, is the first son, and he ends up getting in a scuffle with the Prince of Wales, who's named Henry and they appear to be at each other's throats, which is not good, so all of the publicity people on both sides are like, hey now, you guys need to fake a friendship, like right now, in order to save the political relations between our two countries because we're allies and everything. So they end up doing that and in the course get to know each other and fall in love. Part of it feels a little bit like Escape is Fantasy, like this is the America that I think a bunch of us were hoping for in 2016, and so this is like an alternate reality, but at the same time, it doesn't escape reality either. There are lots of political considerations, there's things that if this were happening in the real world, what would really happen? That's not glossed over, that's not forgotten, which I appreciate. But because of the timeliness of the whole situation, I would recommend reading this one sooner rather than later. It's not going to hold up over time very well, I think. If you weren't alive and politically aware at this part in this part of history, it's not going to have the same impact. Next is The Lady's Guide to Celestial Mechanics by Olivia Waite. It is a historical romance. It's the first in her Feminine Pursuits series. Lucy is an astronomer. She started off as an assistant to her father, who's a very famous astronomer, and as her father's health and, uh, let's say mental well-being declined, she took over more and more of the scientific work until she was doing everything on her own. Unfortunately, her father passes and afterwards she gets a letter from a certain lady, Catherine. Catherine would like to do a translation of a ast astronomical work from French, and Lucy knows French and is able to translate, so you know, unmoored because her father's no there anymore, she goes right down to London and says, hi, I'm here to do the work, kind of shocking Lady Catherine. And the romance goes from there. One of the things I like about this book is that it flips tropes and subverts tropes in ways like uh, Catherine loves embroidery, and in more recent Regency romances, embroidery gets thrown under the bus, like if you're doing embroidery, you're a weak woman, you're not a go-getter, and it's seen as a negative thing, but the way that she does embroidery and how she has used it, almost for her own kind of scientific work in the past, is super interesting and it becomes a big point for several things in the novel. I love this look at marginalized folks in the Regency, not only queer folks, but people of color as well, and also I love that Lucy is allowed to be, to say the thing you want to say when you want to say it. She's given the grace and the opportunity to be scathing and cutting and perfectly witty on the spot, which is someone who has trouble doing that really appreciates being able to read it. It just sounds so great. I do have to say there were a couple of small things that bothered me about the translation bit, but I think that's because I am a translator. So if you're not a translator, you probably won't even notice, but it's a fun romp and I'm really excited about all the side characters. I want to see their happily ever afters now. And last, we have my most recent of these reads, which is Get a Life, Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. Chloe Brown has a near-death experience and decides that she needs to get a life, and she makes a list to this end, and it has all kinds of things she wants to do. Move out of her parents' house, have thoroughly enjoyable but meaningless sex, and do something bad. She ends up roping in the superintendent of her apartment complex to help her do some of these things, like ride a motorcycle, he has a motorcycle, and their love blossoms from there. I have done a full video review of this book where I get all gushy on it, so you can see that here and down below. Know that this book has all the warm fuzzies, that it will just make you feel wonderful as you read it, that there's all of this representation. I mean, it's written by a woman of color with a with chronic pain, and it's about a woman of color with chronic pain. I absolutely love this, so check out that full review if you have any little bit of interest. So there we have it, my top romance for 2019. It was a pretty good year for romance. I really enjoyed a lot of stuff, and I'm looking forward to the fact that a bunch of these are series that are still continuing, so 2020 should be a good year as well. Have you read these books? Would you like to read these books? And what was your favorite romance of 2019? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you're new, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!